And in Mexico City, Pascal Verlein takes his first win, and this time he gets to keep it. Welcome back to Motorsport 101. Yes, a NASCAR reference in an intro. By me, of all people. You should all be proud of how far I've come sharing this podcast with three American hosts. Hey, gang, episode 341 here of Motorsport 101. And uh, welcome aboard as we talk about Formula E's round three in Mexico City. And the vibes are excellent in here because we had a brilliant Formula E race in Mexico City. This was awesome. And we'll talk all about it over the next few minutes or so. Porsche laying a, well, I said on the website, they laid a beating on the field, which means we can only cut to one man first. Um, like, and to, to borrow a Valentine's Day quote, because we are recording this on Valentine's Day from Zoe in our chat. Roses are red. Cam's room is white because Porsche won. Cam, hello. How's it going? <laughs> well, that is the German racing color. Um <laughs> Oh, that's I'm, the reason. <laughs> I'm okay. I'm okay. Just okay. <laughs> yeah, just okay. Uh, as all of you know, I won't get into too much detail on the podcast, but dealing with some stuff as far as an injury, so you know. He's hanging in there. <laughs> yeah, everyone everyone treats their body in their twenties like they're a teenager until the big injury. <laughs> uh could you not say this, given I'm 30 in August? Like, I don't want to be dreading the, the quotes. I've, I've avoided the big injury in my 20s. But, like, I'd like to make it to at least 31st. Like, that would be good to know. Um, <laughs> but, uh, there you go. Also with us, Ryan Eric King. Hello, sir. Yeah. Coming off of uh, the more important holiday than the one today, Super Bowl Sunday. Stop! <laughs> oh, <laughs> Oh, that was all around one of the better Super Bowls I can remember. That was like everything about that was cool. We had a good game, two very good teams, two very closely contested teams, very similar in the end. Uh, the big name players all came through. Uh, Jamar Chase, Stafford, uh, again, speedy recovery to OBJ um, on that one as well. But uh, the Rams came through and... Uh, <laughs> King, your man's got arguably the game-winning play at the end of the game as well. How about that? <laughs> yes, my my former classmate, well, technically uh, upper classmate, a year older than me, Aaron Donald. Uh, <laughs> Watch uh, in crunch time. Wasn't, and... there a, wasn't, wasn't there a story that you were telling us yesterday as we were watching the game about about Aaron, your buddy? <laughs> oh, about how uh, in my last year and the first year he came back to captain the spring game, uh, <laughs> one of my roommates saw him in the liquor store with a shopping cart full to the <laughs> brim. <laughs> Not just the basket, a full cart, <laughs> or, as we, or as we Brits would say, a trolley. <laughs> That's impressive. Like, how do you get? Through? I'm not even going to question or ask how you get through that much alcohol. <laughs> Beautiful. Congrats to everyone on the Rams roster. I feel old as fuck knowing that Sean McVay won a Super Bowl title at 36, and this is his second attempt at it. Yep. Congratulations to uh, Cleveland. You will soon be free of Baker Mayfield. <laughs> <laughs> I joked on Twitter after the game that Baker Mayfield's probably just set himself on fire like that scene at the end of the Da Vinci Code. Um, it's <laughs> for, that, that, that's going real swell for him right now. But yeah, congrats to the Rams. Great halftime show, by the way. If you've not seen it, definitely worth a watch. That was very that was very cool. It was like we were back in 2004 for a moment there. And it wasn't life just better back then. It was just nice. It was just... Just, just, it, just, it was just brought a warm, nostalgic glow as I was watching along with Dr. Dre on the piano and Eminem solving racism by taking a knee. What a guy. Um, in front of Pepsi as well. I mean, it wouldn't be their first time either. Uh, where, where was Kendall Jenner's cameo? RJ, how's it going? <laughs> um, I want to point out this tweet from Roger Sermon in regards to that Pepsi halftime show. Everybody born between 85 and 95 saw the Super Bowl halftime show lineup. It was like, sweet. Instead of doing a show for old people, having guys like the Rolling Stones or Paul McCartney or the Who, mm. they did one for us young people. 
And then 10 seconds later, it hit us. <laughs> We're the old people now. <laughs> hey, uh, did we uh, did we also forget to mention the, the other big sport event that's going on uh, right now? Uh, Winter Olympics? Aye, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Winter Olympics but, are happening. NBC would if, really love you to to watch it on Peacock. Please watch. Like I was joking about this when we were watching the game together on our Discord server. They were so desperate for people to stick around after the game to watch to watch the women's bobsleigh, the mono bob, as I as I, as I learned over the course of. The I mean, day. to be it's fair, that's that was really fun. It reminded me, like, yeah, bobsleigh's really cool. Oh, I wish yeah, they had a way to well. like lessen the impact on the head over the rough ice surface, but you know, <laughs> yeah, we we need we need something fancy on these bobsleds. Maybe something fancy, new, innovative. I call it a suspension. <laughs> that's far too radical, okay? I don't think I can get behind that <laughs> idea. That, that's, that's witchcraft you're, you're, go, you're going through right there. I just don't want to stop them. Yeah. Well, it's like, at least you Americans have won some gold medals. Us Brits have just got, No, it's just not down happening bad. for us over here. We are down bad. Uh, we, we walked into these games thinking six to eight medals, and I was in here like, you guys are funny. Um, I was like, we brought a 50 person team over, and I'm like, you brought this many people to win no medals. Oh, man. This is going to be brutal. Um, but, uh, hey, hey, no, hey we're, we're, this... we're a week into the game, and we're all still bowing, to, bowing down to the almighty Norway. Yeah, Norway owned that collective souls. But given I've made this reference on the show of many a time, salute to Lindsay Jacobellis for finally getting that gold yeah, medal. let's go. <laughs> Two of them now as well, because she got it in the big snowboard across as well. Good for Lindsay, because my God, that that bottle job in Turin in 2006 is still one of the funniest sporting moments I have ever seen in my life. Yeah. Good on you, Lindsay. Way to go. Um, check. More on that soon. But let's get into Formula E, and we'll talk about Mexico City in just a minute. But places you can find us real quick are on YouTube.com forward slash Motorsport 101. Subscribe to us on there. Or on Facebook.com forward slash Motorsport 101. Or on Twitter. A motorsport underscore 101. You can follow us on there. Just crossed a thousand followers. Well, so thank you, everyone, that's following over on there. Our personal handles are on the screen as well. If you're not, if you're watching the log on YouTube, if not, they're at House of 101 HD at RJ O'Connell at Ryan Eric King and at C Buckley 917. All of our details and all that and much, much more is on our website, motorsport101.com, including details on our Patreon page as well. If you want to back us financially. Right, I could hold this Porsche beating in no longer. Let's talk Formula E in Mexico City. You know, that's exactly what they were saying in the race with about 15 minutes to go, that they couldn't hold off this Porsche beating because, as it turns out, uh, yeah, uh, last 15 minutes of the race, uh, Pascal Verline takes the lead. He'd already won pole position. Uh, he finally gets that first win. If you recall three years ago, Luke Stagrassi ripped his heart out over the line, and he got disqualified oh. for all of his hard work and efforts. Last year at Puebla, you may recall Pascal Verlein was on the way to a grand slam, and then paperwork issues. They all go away. But he wins. Andre Lauder finished the second. It's a Penske 1-2. They deliberately Porsche one two. Indy cars next month. <laughs> no, 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 no. If, 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 if Penske, we live Penske in a world, Porsche's next year. <laughs> if we live in a world where it's a Penske one two and FE, meaning a Dragon one two, I'm done with motorsport. <laughs> <laughs> I I will oh, strip man. naked on this podcast if if Dragon Racing ever get a one two finish in Formula E. Uh, I am well, that did, confident. Did, it's I never gonna happen. Penske, did I just yeah. say Penske went to an Indy car? Indy car season preview next week, folks. Yeah, Porsche's first win, a one two finish. They extend the race by a lap. Verline hits the line with a second on the clock left, so we get two laps in the race instead of one. Dre. Was this one of the most dominant performances in Formula E history now that Formula E is starting to rack up? Quite a long history. That was a beating. That was a beating of monumental proportions. I can't remember like a, a, a race in Formula E where one team and both their drivers, both their cars were essentially flawless 
and just completely micromanaged the race to that level of dominance. It was inch perfect. When you're crossing the line with a second to go to make it a 40 lap race instead of a 39 lap race, and they did it on purpose and you knew they could do it just because they could. Oh, it was it was it was poetry in motion. It was it was just complete owning of the field. Like like they overextended everybody else to take track position early on. They came back strong. They used their extra usable energy at the end to get an extra lap out of the race. It's it's a flawless performance. Like there there it was inch perfect. And I've, I've you'd have to go back to like prime DS to Cheetah or maybe Sebastian Buemi in season two when he basically broke the field over over his over their knees. Um, we all remember the, it's the unspoken season in Formula E because Buemi was that good. It's probably in that sort of ballpark, and Buemi was not doing that with both cars. It was on him. It was him mostly on his own. So it's right up there as far as I'm concerned. That was I don't disagree. Impeccable. I don't disagree, and I know the final margin of victory. And you'll see like that nine second gap from the two Porsches to everybody else. It's a little flip flattery because we forget like in the first thirty minutes of this race. Eduardo Martara was up in the mitts. John Eric Vern and Antonio Felix Costa were hanging around the front field. Mm. I, when Mortara first passed Verline for the lead, and this is after like Verline puts on an incredible lunge to defend his position going into turn one. But then a few minutes pass and Mortara gets around Verline. It looked like he just hit the golden mushroom on the front stretch. I've never seen anything like that. Maybe. Maybe like the LMP1 hybrid era when the Porsche would hit VMAX too fast and the Audi would just pull away. So you'd have two overtakes in the same straight. <laughs> it's been a while since I've seen like, but just in terms of like that pace advantage they had from qualifying, I'm shocked Lodward did get on the front row of the fair line, to be honest. Mm -hmm. But they looked like, it looked like one of their cars was going to take pole position and they did. They had enough energy in the tank that they could afford to give up track position early to gain it all back later on in the race. I think this was even better than what we saw at our very first race when Mercedes finished 1-2. And yeah, finally, Pascal Verline finally gets his first win on the board. I told y'all this was going to be a different Porsche. I just had this gut feeling inside of me. And if you trust your gut, Things will always go good. Mm. Yeah, Kick, what did you make of it? Yeah, like, it, it really did feel like, you know, mentioning what RJ said with what happened in Puebla, where last year Porsche clearly had a package that could be dominant, that could, on the right day at the right time, really put off a, a dominant performance, but it, in terms of execution with the package they had, it didn't seem like they had all the parts in place, but this year, with Florian Motlinger at the helm, it feels like this is a completely different team, and when we're talking about, when the drivers are talking about how they planned out a 40-lap race, and they were doing a 40-lap race, they were more concerned about pushing themselves, I think the rest of the field should be worried, because Porsche should know that they're now in a league where they don't have to worry about anyone else. you got to sit with that for eight whole weeks. <laughs> they're going to be stewing on that one. I mean, it's only fair we talk to the resident Porsche man in the room, Cam. <laughs> what did you make of that? How, how big was the grin uh, as, as the last two laps of that race played out? You know, it's a great strategy if you don't have an open, a good opening race for the season to put the rest of the field in a screwed over position by doing an extra lap just because you can and <laughs> flunking some of those competitors out of the points as a result. Um, oh, yeah. If you ever watch Dragon Ball Z when Frieza assumes his final form and then lets Vegeta blow off some steam before kidney punching him for an episode and a half, it's basically how this race went. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> um because the reason why uh, Mortara looked like he got the golden mushroom on the Porsches on the front straight is that the Porsches were conserving energy early on. And then as we hit the midpoint of the race and we saw that what energy they had left, oh, oh, the Porsches have 2% more than everyone else. They ran up, they caught Mortara, they drove off into the distance. 
they put nine seconds on the eventual third place and fourth place team, uh, DS Tachita, who themselves had nine seconds on the rest of the field. It's, it's oh boy. Like, I think that's partly because Motara had to get out and push the last hundred yards, but um, in any essence, that is. Like, Formula E is. Like, we swear it's a really close series. The, the, the fact we're first to fifth is covered by 18 seconds in a race that largely didn't have shenanigans at play. Well, depends if you describe that last lap of shenanigans. We'll get to more on that in a little bit. Um, but in any case, for that beating. Um. Yeah, that was a whooping, and yeah, Pascal Verline finally getting the about damn team. time. Yes, it's about time we've we've taken we the can, piss out of him stop. on quite a few occasions for being a bit passive, and you know it's just never quite come together for Pascal over an entire weekend. Because he got the ninety four back. It, That's it, right. It's the number. Dillbag Gill can't. Dillbag can't keep that number hostage anymore, and now he has his confidence back. <laughs> It's now free. There are no strings on him. Now, one of the things I noticed about that win when we're when watching, when watching it through was uh, Andre Lotzer, who finished in second, was quite muted um, at the end of that race. He, you know, he wasn't exactly all jumping up and down. It was second, you know, you know, warm handshakes all around. And then he seemed to loosen up when his best mate, Jeff, was on the podium alongside him and they're throwing caps into the crowd and everything seemed to be happy again. Um, but Laura was quite disappointed. Um, he expressed his disappointment after the race to the media. The part of the quote from motorsport.com was, quote, from the beginning on, we had a clear teamwork strategy to focus on the race and not race each other. And obviously as a team, you know that that's clear. I just, I just have to be in front next time. Um, and I thought, hmm, was that a team order? Um, like, what... Was Lotterer told to hold station? Because it kind the way he was talking in the it kind of implies that he was. And I want to ask you, gentlemen, do you think it was a team order? And if so, should he have followed it? Because we saw Lotterer pretty much follow uh, Verline bumper to bumper all the way over the line in the end. <laughs> what do you guys reckon? Well, I'm in the camp where I think they did broadcast the team radio at some point during the race, that Verline did have an energy advantage over Lotterer. And oh. from an overall race strategy, you know, element, it makes more sense to have Verline out front using his energy advantage while Lotter is conserving energy to just ensure that if someone were able to catch catch the Porsches, Lotterer has the ability to defend himself. You don't want a sure. situation where they're racing each other and someone catches them and Verline's able to stay, you know, with the leaders. But Lotter just sinks through the field because we see that happen so often in Formula E. The once you once you fall to a deficit compared to the people around you, it's really difficult to make that back up. Uh, mm. did it's exactly what, what we saw at the first half of the race. That's yeah. how Porsche got that advantage, that pace advantage for the remainder. Yeah, and uh, I don't think there was a team order. And, and like, even if there wasn't a team order, I understand why Lauder is disappointed because what he's bit. This is his fifth season, and I think this is his seventh, second place finish. Andre Lauder has never oh. won an E Prix before. Oh, I, I, I forgot. <laughs> I've only just realized that you're right. He has never won an E Prix. Like. Like break, breaking news, uh, ladies, <laughs> gentlemen, and, friend, and, and friends of the non-binary. Um, yeah, Andre Lotzer is the Johan Zarco of Formula E. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm getting oh. it down now. I <laughs> 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 Mark Martin energy. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah Lotter... I mean... <sighs> Go ahead, King. Yeah, that, that oh. Lotter has never won one of these, and it's... I can oh. see the frustrating... Star frustration has... It, it it sink it started to sink in like near near the end of his time at DS to Cheetah that as long as he was at that team he probably wasn't gonna win one and he had to leave. Yeah, no that that would make a lot of sense. RJ, what do you reckon? If Andre Lauder were coming into this series about if it existed about ten or fifteen years ago, I don't think we'd be in the spot. But just just on the 
microcosm of this race. I'm fine with what they did. Because what was one of the things we were talking about uh, when Porsche were the disorganized mess all last season uh, is that Lauderer, and he's gotten better at it this year, is that there is no gap that he will not attempt to car. <laughs> and Porsche, yeah. were, with, with this much riding on it, they weren't going to risk throwing away an easy one to finish from any sort of friendly fire. And the reality is, for most of the day, Pascal Verlein was managing the energy better, and he was quicker. He represented their best chance to win. I say this as somebody who is a big fan. I uh, have followed Andre Lauder's career for the years. You know, it's been almost 20 years since he made his only IndyCar start in Mexico City. Damn. Which IndyCar, he says. Hey, <laughs> I, I mean, it's... it's yeah, in the history of- books, it's all IndyCar. Yeah. He's going to get his chance to win one of these races later on this season. I, If Porsche are this good, I would be shocked if he ends up without a win to finish up this year. Yeah. Um, I mean, like I say, given the situation within the team, they were 29 races into this program. Um, Porsche usually doesn't wait this long to clock up anything resembling success in a series. And given that they, th- you could argue they've thrown away a handful of wins, either through organizational problems or issues out on track. I don't even want to know what the atmosphere within the team would have been like if those two committed friendly fire and threw away a surefire one, two murder death um, kill. <laughs> yeah. Especially with um, rumors swirling about the future of this program with the future of Porsche Motorsport in general and certain other open wheel series. Um, it looks like the Vision GT car. <laughs> it, it, it does. It does. It has the, uh, it, it has squinty 911 headlights. Um, more to that point, if Porsche are this good, Andre is going to get more chances this year. Yeah. I am disappointed on behalf of the Dre Nation that Lotterer let us down today. <laughs> I was joking about it as I was watching the race. I was like, Laura, do the deed. Do it for fellow Dre kind. Send it. You know you want to. I was like, go on. I am a race fan, first and foremost. I am always going to be slightly disappointed we didn't get a fight for the win in the end. But I completely... Like, my level-headed motorsport journalist slash pundit head knows that this was absolutely the right way to go about it 110 percent i i don't think there was an actual team order per se and i hope there wasn't because we're three rounds into a 16 round championship for god's sake please don't start playing this game now hey, um, implying or, other teams won't <laughs> yeah this is formally every point matters <laughs> Exactly. So I, I get it. Like I, I, I understand. Like it's like the angel and the devil on my shoulders here. Like the, the angel is absolutely right and sound in their logic. But god damn it, I want chaos. Um, uh, but we did thankfully have some of that as well. But yeah, I, I completely understand why Lotter has got it. I did not realize that he's been a seven-time second-place finisher. Uh, for, fun, for those of you who have been, to save you the Google search, um, Johan Zarco, eight second places in MotoGP. Um, so, uh, yeah, oh. like, I, I know how that feels. It must be soul-crushing. Um, so, yeah. Um, yeah. Lo- to put that in, in perspective, in another phase of Andre Lauder's career, he's the third winningest driver in Super Formula's combined history going back to 1973. Yeah. It's funny how these things turn out in the end. Um, but yeah, like uh, Lotterer, I mean, he openly admitted that the qualifying is probably what let him down over the course of the weekend. And if you rewatch the qualifying session, it was that semi final duel that he had with Mortara, where he seemingly lost a tenth of a second in the final four seconds of race track. Yeah, he made a big, uh, he made a big uh, error at turn three that put him a little under three tenths behind for the lap. He mm. almost got it back by the end. Such was the one lap advantage Porsche had. Yeah, the, the the penultimate micro sector, he was three hundredths up, and then he ended up about six hundredths down over the line. It was the last five seconds of track. He almost lost a tenth, uh, which I thought. 
That's impressive. How's he, how he, how he managed to do that? Um, but um, yeah, that's probably what did him in um, on, in terms of the the race and how that played out in the end. But yeah, if 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 this is an indication of what's to come from Porsche, I don't think he's got too much to worry about on that front. Speaking of chaos, that final lap was something else. Um, we had what I like to call an energy Ooh, crisis. Boy. We've had a few of these in Formula E. Um, this time, chaotic good. Um, because, as we said, Porsche extended the race for an extra lap right at the end. There were some very nervous Jaguar and Mahindra engineers in the back thinking, how could this possibly have happened, etc., um, there was a whole bunch going on. They didn't even make it on camera. De Freeze recovering from a poor start. Van Dorn was apparently taken out by the grassy off camera and was given a, a time penalty that knocked him out of the points. Jaguar had basically nothing left. I it was it was a lot. So you could argue it maybe exposed some of the shortcomings in the current field. So with that in mind, with three races in now, you know, thirteen to go. Who do you think, given we've got a two-month break coming up around the corner, we're not racing again, unfortunately, until April 9th with Formula E, which is a bummer. Um, which team do you think are going to be scratching their heads most going into this a, a prolonged break? Mm. I know somebody that's chomping on the bit to answer this, but before I get <laughs> into that... Um, I know full well that Deria and Mexico City are not exactly mm. congruent kinds of circuits. They're, they're nothing similar to one another. And the next place we visit is going to be not like none of these other tracks. But with that in mind, what the hell happened to the Mercedes team this weekend, even before Stoffel Van Dorn got game-ended at the end? And even when considering DeVries made a great recovery, they weren't really... Ever since that first race, they really haven't been able to match the factor, the, the Venturi team. And we know it's not necessarily the powertrain because Eduardo Martar and Lucas de Grazzi have been doing all right with it. Yeah. So my question is, and the one that's def Mercedes definitely got to be wondering, because the, I think they mentioned something about the, you know, the, the setups just not balanced correctly. What are St Nick DeVries and Stafford Van Dorn missing that Eduardo Martar and Lucas de Grassi are not. That's what I think Mercedes is going to try and figure out over these next eight weeks to come, because there's a long time to think about it. I was going to say, Cam, didn't you mention the point that they seem to be going through their rear tires like butter at the moment? Yeah, they... Um, the car was visibly had a lot of compliance issues. I think one of the biggest things behind Porsche's speed here is that in the really bumpy sections of the course, they were just gliding over the bumps no problem. The Mercs were bouncing up and down like it was Sabrick, mm. which is uh, not ideal if for uh, tire management. But even factoring that in, Venturi runs the same powertrain and rear suspension, and they were fine across the weekend. I mean, yeah. Degrassi was, wasn't amazing on speed, but Martara was in the fight for the win until the Porsches pulled the pin in the final 15 minutes of the race. Yeah, yeah. Um, but the works Mercedes were just, they just did not have the speed here. Um, I'd like to announce a formal apology to one Ryan Eric King. Um, I, if you remember our season preview, I'm, <laughs> I, was, I was already passed out behind me. Um, I may or may not have, in my haste, picked Mitch Evans to win the championship. Dre Nation, I am sorry. I, I am sorry, I clearly gave them too much credit. Um, again, I don't know what came over me on this one. Um, I should have listened to King. King was right. King was adamant. I could, you can't trust Jaguar racing. And I was like, nah, I don't put it all together. This, <laughs> no, 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 no. Oh, brother, Jaguar stinks. <laughs> oh, it's, it's. It's worse than I thought. I mean, they were probably the biggest sufferers of that final lap energy crisis because they were in the points and rapidly dropped out of them by the time that final lap was over. Um, they've not been great in qualifying. I checked back on the numbers. They've only had one car make the duels in the new qualifying format we've had so far out of six attempts, and that was Sam Bird the very first time they ran that out in Deria. Um, that's the only time a Jaguar was made the final eight. 
Um, so, and as, as mentioned, Mexico pretty much exposed their poor energy conservation. And this is a team that was, was runners up in the, this was this was a team that was runners up in the Destructors Championship last year. I took the bait wholeheartedly. May have gotten that wrong. Um, <laughs> This is not good. This is not good for a team on Jaguars level, especially given they've got a collaboration coming next year. Like, you know, that's not ideal at all. Like, your stock is going down rapidly here. Um, you've got all the talent. You've got two excellent drivers in there and very little to show for it so far. Yeah, I think it, it, it says a lot about Jaguar that they were the biggest losers from the race being a lap, you know, the race being 40 laps and not 39. Because to say to say the race is a lap longer than expected is simply a way of saying that you didn't think anyone could be that fast. And when you're misjudging yeah. how good your competition is, you're assuming that everyone else should be a, a certain pace around you. And if you're clearly not able to keep up with that, you got bigger problems at hand than just, you know, misestimating how fast people are. Yeah, that is an issue. Yeah. That, is, that is a fundamental mismanagement issue. Um, they, and, they had the worst energy consumption of anyone in the top 10. Yeah. By a margin. Yeah. I got a question. Uh, where are we at, at in this stage of the generation two development cycle? Like, surely they've got they've got time to work out these problems, right? <laughs> About that. Uh, this is the end of the cycle. They know it's the end of the cycle. This is it. Like, this is your best chance. You had one of the stronger cars in the field last year. Like, yeah. and on, oh. on paper with. You know, development and technical convergence. The cars on paper should be as close to as close together as you're possibly gonna get. If someone's that much mm -hmm. faster than you, it probably isn't that much in it, and it's a lot down to how your team is set up. Yeah, like we know I need to drive. Yeah, out. look, look, I have seen enough of Sam Bird and Mitch Evans in Formula E to give them the benefits of the doubt over their current struggles. Right, but this go this starts from the very top. If you're if you you're, you're Jaguar's message in that last race was our car can't do forty laps, and that's not good. And somebody yeah. <laughs> when when the Porsche when Porsche could have they literally could have slowed down one corner. Instead, they told Pascal and Andre to speed Push. up to prove to themselves that they could do forty yeah. laps, and and they did comfortably. Yeah. You know what this is? This is like a WWE wrestler that's like it thrown in the main event. You ask them to go like twenty five <laughs> minutes, and they're gassed by by like ten. Yeah, right, and, and it's not just, and it's not just that. It's even on the final lap. Even if Porsche had not pushed for that extra final lap, they still would have been in trouble compared to everyone around them in yeah. the top ten. They were down by yeah, like two were, two to struggling. three percent compared to everyone around them in the bad. race. Everyone down to like the dragons and the neos, who we know do not have the equipment to go and fight for the top ten consistently. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cal, I know you also wanted to mention a little bit about Andretti as well. Um, just yeah, they, they um, went quite hard by this at all. Oof, uh, Andretti stink. That turned around um, quick, didn't it? <laughs> yeah, uh, the highest of highs, lowest of lows. I mean. Jake Dennis only cracked the top 10 because of the energy fuckery created by the extra lap. And um, Degrassi's Askew, penalty. And Lucas Degrassi. And Degrassi's penalty as well. Both directly benefited them because otherwise they just had no speed here. Mm. And Askew, give him the benefit of the doubt because we know being a rookie in FE is very hard. Very. He's actually been doing a reasonably good job as far as uh, lap time given the expectation for rookies coming into the series. Jake Dennis was a revelation last year. Mm. He fought for the championship right until the very end. He has been nowhere. Uh, I'm going to push back on that a little bit. He's seventh in the standings to score points in every round. I mean, yeah, yeah I, this was not his weekend. I definitely say that, good. you know, we'll I'll give Askew a bit more time because he's a rookie. But 
Andretti are certainly at the moment bottom of the midfield. Yeah. No yeah, idea. like here's the thing. Last year they were consistently fighting for at least a podium. We're getting occasional wins. They've not looked even remotely in contention for a win at any race so far. Yeah, that's never a good sign. I mean, if, if we're if we're shouting out teams that are underperforming, I mean, we haven't even gotten into Mahindra. Mm. Not like Sims car died for the second race in a row, and. Roll, Oliver Rowland's been a, was a total non factor this weekend. I I don't get it. This team used to be yeah. Good. They were another team. They actually uh, in vengeance for holding Pascal Verlein's number hostage. <laughs> um, Pascal basically destroyed their race by doing that extra lap, and the social media team for Mahindra were quite displeased. <laughs> I think the quote. I think the crack, no. I think the literal tweet with, with about a lap to go from the admin was, ah! <laughs> <laughs> That's never a good sign when even the admin knows we can't make it. <laughs> We're in the, it's like the admin's like, ha ha, I'm in danger. Like Ralph Rigg about the Simpsons. Um, and Alex Sims has had, has had two DNFs already. And like, you know, it just wasn't meant to be for Sims when he missed I the duels by man. three hundredths of a second and he had to start the race from 13th. Uh, that, that's when you just know, you know how bad it is when here's here's what I'm looking at right now because I'm looking at the race results as we speak um, you know how bad you know how down bad you have to be when you're being outpaced legitimately if you're Jaguar and Mahindra right now you just got beaten by Oliver Turvey in a Neo um, please someone please someone uh, give Oliver Turvey surgery he's, I'm, he's I'm starting a hashtag during every Formula E weekend going forward known as Free Oliver Turvey. That man deserves better. Look at him. Look at him. Give him a seat. Give him a good seat. He's yeah. good. He's really I mean, good. I'm just looking Oliver, at the gap. Oliver Turvey, what, Oliver Turvey is Damian Lillard embracing the crime. Oh. Yeah, brutal. Absolutely brutal. Yeah, I mean, looking at the gaps, I mean, we talk about the underperforming teams. Dennis was 26 seconds down on the winning Porsches. Um, Sam Bird, the top Jag, was 35 seconds down. That's half a lap. <sighs> yeah. Um, Roland yeah. was 36 seconds down from Mahindra. It's it's not good. Yes, it's not good at all. There's 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 a lot of teams back there that that uh, are going to be doing some good old head scratching over this next uh, two month break before we go to Evans was over a minute off. <sighs> oh, rough. I know Evans was really low on energy as well. But gentlemen. Overall thoughts on that race in Mexico. For me. I loved it. I thought it was good entertainment. Uh, Robin Friends drove spectacular with some great overtakes, even if he didn't have the results to show for it. Uh, shout outs as well to Eduardo Matara for almost taking pole position while doing the trick where you ever play a Gran Turismo game and you're just beating the AI so badly that you think you're going to throw the handbrake on <laughs> yep. to spin your way across the line. Yeah, Martara almost did that, but that wasn't deliberate. He legitimately <laughs> lost it coming out of Peraltada. He was on full uh, oppo the, the all the way through the <laughs> that, no, that was good. It, it was good racing. I love this track layout. I think uh, if we are to race uh, Formula E cars in the country, Mexico, preferably it should be here sure. on this layout whenever possible. Absolutely. Um, Burrow Soul Stadium looked great. I got no complaints about this. Yeah, one. seriously, I, I had no complaints. I, I Honestly, my gut reaction is like Formula E is back. This is, this is the Formula E that I love. And this is honestly the <laughs> the race event that, that sold me on the new duels format because pretty much every duel was exciting. A lot better here. And and they yes. they fixed the wait times yeah. between duels, so it was it was it felt almost instantaneously between duels. Yeah. Way better. Way better. Way better than the opening 100%. round Centuria. Um <laughs> Goodbye, old qualifying format. Piss you rest. <laughs> yes. You will not be missed, folks. Um, <laughs> you will not be missed. Um, this was everything right about Formula E over the last few years. Without the artificial contrived, we get we have to make the field closer for closer sake bullshit. Mm -hmm. This was great. More of this. 
Yeah, like, I've I written and told people regarding Formula E that, you know, what we've seen so far has been promising, but I was all at the back of the head fear that this might be some of the chaos coming out of the series, which, let's be honest, if you're here now, in Season 8 now of the Formula E, you've had to have at least to some degree embraced it for what it is if you're still watching eight years in, right? Yeah. This was great. This was yeah. everything good and everything I like about Formula E in one package. We had passing, we had drama, we had strategy play a major role in the race. It told a story. It swung back and forth. And we got a good version of what happened at Valencia last year. Like, that was beautiful race management from Porsche <laughs> all the way through. Mandra and Jaguar wouldn't, wouldn't agree with you. <laughs> Jaguar, I say, charge your batteries. Oh. Point is, is that this was great. This was everything good about Formula. I'm glad King mentioned it as well. The duels were way better this time round. They they closed that that time difference up excellently. There was drama all the way through. I still love Andre Lotter's turn to the camera like he's some sort of Bond villain. He really <laughs> has like the perfect sort of grey hair and menacing tone for it. It's wonderful. Um, if you haven't seen me, I may or may not have made a Gladiator reference in my race review regarding that on the website. So check that out if you haven't already for, if you want a bit more of my thoughts. Because I actually did a running diary of, of qualifying and duels as it happened because I was watching at work as it was going down. So I thought, let's take some notes and see, and see how this goes. It was very fun. This was an outstanding race. Great stuff from Formula E. This is exactly why people got into this series, and I hope there's more of it going forward. As I've alluded to, unfortunately, this is going to be the last time we're going to be talking about Formula E for eight weeks. Because, of course... Wrote yeah. the schedule. Oh. Got to thank our good friends oh and the People's God. Republic of China for not allowing us to have races in this in the intermediate intermediate God. period. God damn it, China! Um, yes, uh, we'll be back on April 9th for Formula E because, and my brother told me to say this on the podcast because he's a Juventus fan. <clears throat> it's coming to Rome. Um, <laughs> Uh, on April 9th and 10th uh, for the next rounds of Formula E. But in the interim, next t- next two weeks, we're going to be intense with season preview action. IndyCar coming up next because their season starts in St. Petersburg on February 27th. Yes. So that <laughs> yes, it's the biggest this. IndyCar season in recent history. I want to say 17 rounds, and I want to say 26 full-time cars this year. May the good Lord help us all. It's going to be fun. We'll break all of that down later on this week. But uh, basically, you can find us one more time. We're on YouTube.com forward slash Motorsport 101. or Facebook.com forward slash Motorsport 101. Instagram at Motorsport 101 pod. Twitter at Motorsport underscore 101. Our personal handles are on the screen right now. At Harrison 101 HD. At RJ O'Connell. At Ryan Eric King. At Cbugby 917. My race review personally. And all some extra notes will be on the website as well. Motorsport101.com. Check that out if you haven't already. Until then... Pascal Verlein, what a Valentine's Day he had. Sign out, everybody. Bye. Later, y'all. About damn time, guys. <laughs> uh, folks, I do also need to let you know that this uh, this whole podcast was just a 45-minute oh, advertisement oh. for crypto. Also, the QR code. Juventus, it's coming Rome. Uh... You meant to still play in Rome. Listen, listen, yeah? My man is, my brother is secretly Italian, okay? He can't <laughs> help himself, okay? Why are you like, lying better than the uh, I'm not. <laughs> it's a lost cause at this point. If he's, if he's really Italian, <laughs> where is he still <laughs> his Gabagool? <laughs>